All right. So I, I just wanted to start really quick with, uh, and, and just to contrast with uh, Jamal's style, um, I'm going to actually try to structure it a little bit and see how things go. So first, to begin with, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to show what we had tried to do last year. How many people here were at the BOF last year? At this BOF? Okay, not as many as I thought it would be. Ah, uh, Dave, your seat is over here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's to save the mic runners from having to run up and down. Um, so I, I just wanted to show what we did last year, and it was a four and a half hour session, and it was kind of fun and interesting and everything else. And I wanted to set the context of how far we've come. So as you notice, last time I called it the fantasy agenda, and it was three pages long and had a bunch of output. So since then, progress has been made. In my mind, and people can disagree, and, and I want it to be interactive, so if people, I encourage people to disagree or add points or subtract points. But I think, in my mind, the three most substantial and impactful things that have happened from a switch dev perspective is we've added on the two-phase transactional model. This was, um, I think I've personally lost about three days of my life in discussions around around whether uh, it should be a transaction model, how to be guaranteed resources will not run out, and, there, and software and hardware and all of that. So this is actually a big step forward. The other one that has probably taken 10 days of my life is hierarchical operations. Like if you have devices that are stacked on top of each other, how are you going to deal with that? And, uh, and I see the Mellanox people taking pictures because uh, Mellanox took pole position. This is, uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Dave's last year's uh, statement was one of the most significant things that will happen in this in the space of switch dev will be a hardware vendor stepping up and saying I'm going to submit a driver and that happened so <laughs> it's a good thing it's going to make everything move forward um, looking at things that again actually before I move forward anybody want to add or subtract from that things that people think are very significant, things that we should all be standing up, sitting up, and taking notice on? I'll take that as a no. Um, OK, so immediate things worth looking at, right? I mean, there are, in my mind, one of the things we've talked about, in NetConf at least, is there's a bunch of things that an SRIOV embedded NIC, or a NIC embedded switch, rather, has uh, that could possibly benefit from thinking about how switch DevOps are evolving. So I would encourage everybody to go see how their particular devices, switch functions, could be leveraged or could be cross-leveraged with switch dev. Because here's a statement I want to make. And I want to, again, I, for people specifically who are in the path of building ASICs, I want you to think about. Your, your NICs today have switches that may or may not have limitations. These limitations will go away over time. Whatever infrastructure we put in has to be forward-looking, not backward-looking. And, and I would say the forward-looking model is make all the switches look the same, because they will eventually have the same functionality. So use the infrastructure, move, move the ball forward, rather than coming up with more and more divergent methods that eventually result in the Linux way of doing things being divergent, which is a problematic state that Linux gets into. For any operating system and for any user operation, the more divergence you have, the worse it becomes over time. And obviously, being open source helps in that space. Um, clearly, there's a bunch of work to be done around stats, as we talked about in the previous BOF about a half an hour ago. This is one of the places where hardware always falls down because stats and the way they get reported are always problematic. Well, it's a place where Linux has fallen down, too. And a place where Linux has fallen down, as well, because yes. It, it's amusing. Right now, you, if you do an interface dump, you get 2K of information, and only like a couple bytes of that are the useful statistics you actually want from the device. So that's, that's a really silly design, and it's a really poor user experience. And the dash S. Eth tool dash S is the bane of many, many devices' existence. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's really a pain point. So yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. It's all about interop, right? Linux, the open source infrastructure allows interop. So we have to pay emphasis to that. Um, there's a couple of things you'll hear about uh, device management. 
that, oh, by the way, did I tell you that there is a surprise list of speakers I'm going to pull up? And uh, Jiri, I think you just guessed one. <laughs> uh, so device management is, again, another painful user experience. You don't want to have, on this device, do this. On that device, do that. Go find the wiki page. Go find somebody's random email. So I'm starting to have an opinion that uh, there's a minor exception to that philosophy, and that is the act of creating devices. Yeah. That's a layer that has to exist in some way, shape, or form. And then, yes, afterwards, there should be a very straightforward, single way to configure that thing after it exists. Yeah, actually, that's what I meant to say, that there needs to be some sort of ops that people understand are, are standard. And before that, you do whatever you need to do. But once they exist, you interact with it in a standardized way. One thing, I mean, we, we are learning this. Cumulus has seen this over and over again. Um, you don't want to operationalize anything that requires the user to have to go figure out which device have I installed, when did I buy it, what OS am I running on it, or what distribution am I running on it. That just destroys the end user experience. But each device has to be able to get there, obviously, on its own. Resource management, that's my personal uh, pet peeve. With the two phase going in, that's hopefully something that we'll also actually do some work in. and. Uh, and step up and provide software and patches for. But this, to me, is one of the single largest spaces where we as a, as a group can influence the hardware as well to make sure that accounting and early under notification of running out of resources are well reflected. But software also has the ability and the, uh, the awareness that there is resources underneath it that it needs to be able to manage. It's very similar in my mind to like managing a translation look aside buffer or something like that, where you need to know what's underneath and you don't oversubscribe it. And I wanted to remind people that data path modeling is a different buff on a different day. Uh, so, so keep that subject for the next day. Um, so this is, I think, in my mind, the immediate things that I, I would expect patches and code to be submitted to be reviewed for moving ball to be moved forward in the short term. Anything that I've left out, anything that, well, actually, there's the TC part, but we already covered that in a different BOF, too. Um, and that's why I left it out here. But anything else that, uh, that people think or people are working on that they want to say, hey, I'm working on this, pay attention to it? Yeah, we, we have a couple of problems. We will... Who's got a floating mic? Here. Right next to you. Yeah, we have a couple of problems we encountered, and we would like to present it. And uh, I, I think it, uh, half an hour would be enough. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you we have can a speaking do it. slot. Uh, it's a slot. Yeah, okay. you're the first speaker, by the way, so get warmed up. It's the cool. next thing. Okay. Cool. Um, no, but if there if there's a list, I guess what I w wanted to say was, so and and maybe that's what you are saying, is there a list of things that I think needs group focus, things that people have to agree on? Clearly the, the two-phase, the, the thing, um, uh, stats, these were all things that were very contentious and took a while to get here. I, I'm, I personally am impressed and happy and thrilled that we are where we are since, I would say, Dusseldorf, since like in Dusseldorf there was wide divergence and I think now there is generally wide convergence. I think that's a good thing. Anything that I missed, anything that people think we should be looking at hard from a... All right, so continuing forward then. Mellanox, Jiri, come on up. That's you. Uh, yeah, we, we have a couple of slides, so can we... Could I, yeah, yeah. Could Oh, I guess they'll have to, uh, Pablo. Yeah, yeah. Come on up, come on up. Do, don't feel, this is not a trap door. Hmm? <laughs> yep, uh, we have a lot of t-shirts, like this ones, right? And after the, this, it's not all. After the end of the buff, we are, uh, we have uh, like boxes uh, on the outside of the room, so we are we will be giving it to you. So don't hesitate to go there and get some. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't want to carry that. Everybody, please help Judy out. Don't make him carry that on the plane. Hi. Um, so, basically, we stumbled upon a problem that I believe every uh, switch dev driver author will bump into in the future. Uh, and the main problem is that when we configure devices, we don't necessarily know that later on we are going to offload them, such as lag and bridge. Uh, and I will present more uh, concrete examples. Um, so there are two schools of thought regarding how we can solve this problem. Uh, and the first one is dynamic. So it basically says that once we know that uh, a device is going to be offloaded, such as when the first port joins an empty lag, uh, then we should configure the hardware. Uh, and the second one is, is binding uh, these devices to the hardware uh, at creation time. And one possible uh, way to do this is to basically create like um, a virtual switch device uh, and enslaving it to the lag or the bridge or whatever, which also means with it, that we need to instantiate several of these. Um, so we are going to start with the first problem. Uh, we call it the first order problem. Uh, and it basically involves a offloading uh, a bridge on top of lag. So the, how currently we offload bridge is by uh, receiving the change upper from the bridge driver. And uh, then the switch dev attributes and the objects are propagated using the switch dev infrastructure to the driver and we configure the hardware accordingly. Um, and the way we offload lag is by uh, receiving the change upper from the team or bond uh, drivers and again configuring the hardware. And of course, we can have a, a lag that is enslaved to a bridge. Um, in that case, when the lag device joins the bridge, it simply, it simply propagates the change upper notification from the bridge device to each one of the enslaved ports. Uh, so each, at least in our driver, each port uh, thinks that is a member in the bridge. Uh, and this is the, the problem. Uh, if we first put the, the switch port under the lag, uh, and then uh, we enslave the lag to the bridge, then everything is propagated cor correctly and is working. But if we change the order, and this is completely valid, uh, and we first create the lag, uh, then put the lag under the bridge, and only later enslave uh, one of the switch ports uh, to the lag, then everything breaks because uh, the physical port doesn't, doesn't know that it's a member in a bridge. It's only aware of the lag because uh, of the event mechanism. Uh, and this is the problem in more detail. Uh, so the x axis is time. Um, so first putting this uh, port under lag, we get uh, the notification to the driver and, that, and we know that the port is in lag and only then putting it in a bridge, uh, it's okay because the port will know that it's now a member in a bridge and a lag. But flipping this order and only adding the port uh, at the final stage isn't going to work. And this is something that everyone will bump into in case their hardware supports both flag and bridge of load. I mean, uh, this sounds unsolvable I, I, in some sense. I don't think there's an alternative here, right? Whenever you make a change like this, you have to reevaluate your tree because y you have a relatively simple example that physical port could have a VLAN on it, yeah. and the VLAN could not be a member of this tree at all, right? It could be 
I could be taking a VLAN out and sending it somewhere else and get routed on that. Right. So you have to reevaluate the tree. There is no fast path here. You have to go all, like say every, every master that I have has to be evaluated all the way from the top. Okay. On every insertion. Yeah, so um, I think you're basically stating the, the static approach where we know uh, from the first step that this is going to be offloaded. Yep. Um, the port gets into the lag, you will evaluate the bond, right? You will configure the bond in hardware. Yeah. And when you're configuring bond in the hardware, you have to walk its relationships that is upper devices, to know that it is part of a bridge. Yeah. So he... I, I think I understood his point just now. So you're saying the case where the devices are dynamically going from offload to non-offload case, is that what you mean by dynamic? Non-offload. No, but by dynamic, I mean that... Dynamic means that... You don't need a microphone. Okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't need one, but... Dynamic means that when you create a network entity, whether it is bond, bridge, yeah. VRF, you don't know at the time of creation whether it is all offload or not. Exactly. So, it's so this is dynamic comparing dynamic. to the static that you know in advance. Yeah. I, no, I'm just going to drop this mic here. Maybe I'll make Harrison hold on to it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you're talking about just whether the devices are dynamically being brought in and out of offload case. Yeah. Uh, you still have to evaluate the whole tree. I don't see a way around it. So, uh, one solution that we want to propose, and this is something that is currently not in code. The, the problem is in code, but the solution isn't. Uh, and is that when the, the port joins this slug or whatever umbrella device, like a bridge, it's basically sending this not notification that we can call it switch dev change lower, and then um, devices that are interested in these kinds of uh, notifications, and currently only bridge uh, registers um, a switch dev notifier, can simply get it and see that this uh, device is a lower device of them and play back all the settings. Uh, so in case of bridge, this will be the change upper and the switch dev uh, attributes and objects. But y y I like the idea, but you'll have to do it for all devices. I mean, like I said, when you get to VLAN routed, you're going to end up... Doing you, 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 you're right. This is exactly what the next slide stated. Okay. <laughs> it is much more than that. Yes. Uh, so like uh, Shrijit just mentioned, this can get uh, very complicated in the future where we need to offload other kind of devices on top of this team and bridge. Uh, and in this case, we uh, probably need to um, make sure that all these settings are playbacked in the correct order. And another disadvantage is that we will probably have um, very complicated rollbacks in case we need to error out. Because, uh, and this is something Matty mentioned, um, if you are going to offload um, a, a router on top of this bridge, then we suddenly need to offload all these routes to hardware. Yeah. And this is something that can fail. So I, I noticed um, there's a teaming driver, not a bonding driver yeah. in this slide. Sure. Oh, no, actually, nobody, I was, nobody I, actually uses bonding anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, um, I, but I will actually make a... I will make a, a point for Jiri because if uh, actually the teaming driver is cleaner here than bonding, the bonding driver right now has very weird complexities with link speed and valuation and things like that. So this problem, even for the pure software stack, exists if you're using the bonding driver right now. I think this might be, I'm mostly looking at Dave to see which way his head is shaking. It might be an opportunity for us to clean up that part of it as well, if that's a risk worth taking. Because this, this stacking problem with the bonding interface right now is kind of weird. It, uh, it goes to ETH tool ops to find link speed, and there's all kinds of bizarre loops that it creates. And didn't we have a set of patches recently specifically to add 
fake speeds to software devices so yep. that this yes. thing would work. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it is a problem. But yes. I don't know. But isn't the link speed fun fundamentally part of the the algorithm that the that bonding module is trying to implement? You know, like no, it's it's part of the algorithm. It's just the teaming driver is very clean. You have clean notifications, you take action asynchronously as opposed to synchronous inline calls which may get stuck and then you don't know where it fails. So this problem is a very real problem and if you're going to go put infrastructure in place, maybe it's worth investigating that across the board. So I'll say one thing ahead of time, any solution that doesn't have extra state involved, I prefer. And that's why I kind of I kind of like the notifier idea because it says, "Hey, layer that knows all the information already, please re-execute all of these actions." And it has it already had to store all the the information anyways. There's no duplication of information anywhere. Um, but anyways, please continue with your presentation. Okay. Um, so a different solution is like we stated previously is to make this lag aware of the hardware from the creation time. And one possible implementation uh, is to simply instantiate this switch dev zero device. Um, I don't know how. And um, enslave it to the lag device. Um, and um, in, in certain, and this means that we have a direct pipe to the hardware. Uh, for every configuration that is done on this lag or a device on top of it. Uh, and we need to cache certain things in the driver um, for when we uh, enslave ports into this lag. So basically, I just want to add <coughs> that this is not the thing. No, this is not the thing. No, no, this, no. Is, this is just a, uh, you can have, a, you, you would, be possible to have uh, like a couple of those virtual ports, which would be only uh, used for in order to bind some uh, team or bond or bridge to the to to some specific hardware. So it, it's rare, and it uh, it's just uh, it's just an idea. It's it has the same problem. You'll end up with resol resolution loops because. Mm. So, so in that in that direction, actually, you're not caching anything because whenever a, a bond was created, you created in the hardware, and whenever you configure it, whether there are ports in the bond or not, you configure it, you configure the hardware. But so. you don't know that, right? Because you might, as I said, later you might decide to take one of the physical ports and VLAN them and split them, in which case your previous structures have already been built and no one knows to replay them. So then you end up caching, which is the last line of the previous slide and then refer to Dave's comment about caching. Well, why, why so, do, what is the scenario that you cache again? The, yeah. if, you're, if you have a hierarchy and you're using some other device to sort of resolve the hierarchy, right? Somebody has to remember that there's a hierarchy and you need to go rebuild. That's the cache. You're not, you're not re if you're reevaluating everybody, then you don't need this extra anchor. No, but again, if, if I had uh, attributes I had an, a notion whether a VRF or namespace is offloadable or bridge is offloadable or bond is offloadable. And then for each entry in those tables, I just configure the hardware immediately. I don't need to cache anything in software. All is offloaded immediately to the hardware. Right. But somebody has to remember that it was offloaded or not offloaded, and whether it needs to be reevaluated or not reevaluated, right? So, so if it is offloaded, of course, but this is orthogonal to that. Whenever there is a rule in software, I have a flag that state whether it is offloaded or not. And if there is a container, again, network entity which is supposed to be offloaded, all the entry in this entity are offloaded. So if there is a failure, of course, then we need, this is another topic. Oh, you're saying every device would have to register as an offload device. Exactly. Yeah. Every device yeah. has, a, has an attribute. Is it yeah. reflected to the hardware? And it goes back to, G, to, to Jamal's uh, statement. It's not a binary. It can be either reflected or not reflected or both. But once it is reflected, it's the responsibility of the, of the driver to verify that all the tables that should have been reflected are reflected, indeed, exist in the hardware. If not, it's a bug. Okay. And then it's stateless.
Um, so the second problem, and all three problems are uh, integrated uh, together, uh, is what we call less port standing. Um, so basically, if we have um, ports in a lag and then we start passing traffic, uh, then we get two entries in the FDB. Uh, one is marked with self, and this is directly dumped from the hardware. Uh, and the second one is from the software bridge driver uh, marked as offload because it was externally learned and the driver notified the bridge. Now, in case we remove the last port from the lag, then uh, it's no longer offloaded. So this FDB entry is deleted from the hardware, but the one in the software bridge, bridge still exists, which is inconsistent. Uh, and there are two solutions to this problem. Um, the first one is again is the dynamic one and is simply to introduce a new event called FDB flash, similar to FDB add and del, and then the uh, bridge driver will simply flash all the FDB entries pointing to this lag or any other device, any other upper device on top of this lag. And the right, and the second solution is again. Um, if this lag is always offloaded, then uh, we don't flash this hardware entry when the last port is leaving the lag, uh, and therefore we don't need to flash the software bridge entry as well. So I, I like they've preferred the, the first solution, but I understand that other people, what? So, so the summary is simply this in my mind. See if I got this right. This Either you reevaluate re the whole hierarchy, option one, or you have optimization that says off the hierarchy, certain devices are registered to some master database, and that master database is going to optimally reevaluate pieces of the hierarchy that changed. Those are the two choices. Right? My opinion is we won't get two right. Let's do it with one and if we can optimize it later, it's an optimize it later. But trying to do start with two means we are going to end up with all kinds of inconsistent state. And I, I, it's, I'm sure it can be made to work. It makes me nervous. With your, with your name, uh, what do you mean? Uh, I'm saying just reevaluate from the top. When there's a change, just so you say start. you say we go with the, the dynamic approach. Yes. Yeah, that's. That's, that's, that's why we are presenting this, because we are not sure what, because there are advantages and disadvantages, uh, disadvantages for both. So One we, try, we, we, we have to choose the lesser evil, I would say. So if the lesser evil is dynamic, I don't know. Some people might think otherwise. I think that one of the strong points of starting at least with the dynamic one is that we don't change the way users are um, accustomed to create devices and we don't change anything that is user facing so we can always revert this and try something else if it doesn't work um, let me take the second approach just to, that we will take the right decision okay, so now we know who's, it. Well, now we know who's on which side yeah. okay got it <laughs> So the problem with the first approach is it is undeterministic. You don't know what will be, what will happen eventually. So you can configure the millions of routes and it will be okay. And then some user will add a port to your bridge and suddenly all those million routes should go to the hardware and you don't know which one of them will fail or not. What will happen in the hardware, how the LPM look like in opposed to the um, uh, static approach in which on pair configuration you can uh, return uh, success or, or failure uh, according to uh, the hardware capability. Um, and this is something I don't know how to solve. Um, I, I, I don't see that as a problem. I, I, I mean, in either case, you'll have the FIB in the, in the kernel somewhere. The FIB isn't like disappearing, or the FDB is not disappearing. So I think. I think the important point is that if you do things this way, then 
you, you're not in the context that created the conflict yes. to begin with, and therefore you don't have anyone to signal the appropriate error to. And that's an interesting issue to think about. But, but we don't have to signal, right? I mean, authoritative answer exists. The, the kernel still is your master database. So, so you don't need, my counter to that would be, you don't need a second entity to resolve things for you. You can still make the same choices you would have made at the beginning of time. But it might be suboptimal. You might have to go all, roll back all the way to the top of the tree and reevaluate. And maybe it's slow, the first, but I would optimize later rather than optimize for that case today. Srijit, I think that a, a, a system that is built of hardware that, rep, that is represented in the, in the kernel database may be hack, behave sometimes differently that if you are just building it hierarchically, it just won't behave properly. For example, if you're creating a lag, link aggregation in the hardware, and normally you can create a lag, all the ports are down, and you have a static FDB entry with a Mac pointing to that lag, that's a total valid mm -hmm. a, a implementation that it's called black, black hole uh, 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 forwarding. You have like a black hole port that you want the, the MAC addresses to go to that port and be dropped. Sure. Why? Because it can happen. No, no, but yeah, the kernel FTP should exist, right? Otherwise, the kernel is doing something. Yeah, but that you're you reflecting it only once the hierarchy is built, right? So now what will happen is you will create a flood in the hardware that entry won't exist. Entry doesn't exist in the bridge, it just floods. It, it won't go and create a lag and say drop that, port, that packet. It will say, I don't know this Mac, I'll flood it. Because at, at the hardware, at the, at the kernel level, there were not, no ports related to that team or to that bond. So it doesn't reflect all the Macs that is related to that, to that port, right? So you, you I'm created not, a different I'm behavior. Sorry, I'm not sure I followed the example completely. Is, am I the only one? That... It's bond without ports. So, so you have a bond without ports. So this bond is not configured in hardware, right? Yes, okay, and, and so shouldn't be configured in software either. I mean, what is a bond without ports in software? Just bond without ports. Okay, but it doesn't... User create a bond. Sure, user allowed to create a bond, right? A bond zero device, your driver should be rejecting it, should be doing nothing to it. Okay, first so I can now uh, add this bond to a bridge. The Without ports, bond without to a bridge. Ports. Right. You still don't have anything, you have nothing to do here. Right, right. Okay. And then the, you know, on the bridge yeah. are a lot of other ports. I'm, I'm, I'm playing along. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Like no, no, I'm no, playing I'm, along, so I'm, nothing happened yet. Yeah, nothing happened yet uh, at this point. So there are uh, another, uh, some other ports on the bridge which, which are uh, physical switch ports. Yep. That's great. So now I can configure FDP entries yeah. on the bond itself, pointing to the bond. How did you do that? Because there is no is it statically configured. Yeah, know? statically configured. So somebody entered a FDB oh, entry point. Static configuration. Yeah. The ports are not Flow. Yeah. No, so yeah, yeah. So the, I'm 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 playing along. So the user configured yeah. a FDB entry pointing to the bond. Right. And so all those FDB entries are, are not offloaded since they are related to a bond, which is not there. Yeah. So. So you'll flood so all the Yeah. So in in okay. So in hardware I'm flooding. In software I'm not. So I create a black hole in software, though in the hardware I'm flooding the traffic. But that's a choice for you, right? You can choose to not install the entry because none no, of I your choose, ports I are choose alive. to do a black hole. As I'm a user, choose to do a black hole unless there are ports in that bond. So if it's a, but it's a, okay, maybe we are going way off topic here, but no, if, but if you're doing... Cases, the corner cases are the issue, right? The, the issue is when you try to make a... You, you take a switch dev, you take a Linux which was not designed for that, and now you start to build a product these guys are trying to build the product with it, and you run into those kernel no, no, But, but okay, kernel the answer to me kernel. is very simple. I mean, we are actually doing this today. You model your hardware behavior to be exactly identical to the software bridge. Mm -hmm. So it's the behavior, not if there's an FDB entry, it doesn't mean you have to have an FDB entry. You get to choose, but you have to model the behavior exactly right. So if the behavior of the software bridge is no flood, don't set up a flood list on the, on the hardware bridge. I don't, I don't think I get you. I do want to create a black hole. How do I do it with the existing tools? What is the behavior? Is it an FDB pointing to a null, null yeah. device? Mm -hmm. So whatever the hardware construct is, that's what you have to put in. It cannot be a flood list of existing ports. Let's take this offline. But you cannot flood. I mean, I guess the point I'm making is you cannot flood in hardware. So, so I think that there are tons of Okay, going to the dynamic approach, may I end with, maybe this is, okay, so, so maybe uh, taking it 
are, as baby step, maybe this, this is should, the direction we should take, but uh, we should know in advance there are a lot of corner cases in that area. Uh, we can take VXLAN another example, but I'm not sure uh, we, we want to go there. Another example, which is actually not related to order, it's related to, you can call it a policy, is, uh, and I want to raise that, and we don't have it on the slide, so I will just say it. Um, let's think of um, uh, a routing table. So I, as a user, may have a different v uh, VRF in my network, different namespaces or light VRF, it depends on how I choose to implement it. Part of them are related to management network, part of them are related to a, a, a real data network. And let's, uh, I, I will do something weird and I will give a Nick example, which is not usually what I'm doing. But I have um, actually two NICs in my network, though not uh, one switch. And those two NICs are, uh, uh, sit on a data path, both of them, on the same VRF. So uh, now I configure uh, a list of routes. Part of them are actually behind NIC A ports. Part of them are behind NIC 2 ports. So, and there is another VRF, which are management ports. So how do I know which route to configure where? In that, without the notion of which VRF related to which net device, to which other entity. So you picked probably the best example that I can answer. But before I do, uh, anybody else have any comments, thoughts? Uh, are most people busy with email? OK. Uh, email it is then. Um, VRF is easy. You have a master device. The master device has to be offloaded. If you haven't, then it has to be bound to the offload. If it's not, you're done. No, so OK. So if the VRF is bounded to some virtual device that give it the policy that's again. So this is the, the, the static approach. But that's the one, well, I, that's not static. That's the offload part, right? You're, you're indicating. We haven't talked about route offloads anyway in, in general, but I'm assuming just like FDB offload, the moment you say route offload, you have a device or an anchor that, that route exists in, right? The moment you have that, you can resolve that. No, but, but OK. So if you're referring to the next of device, so it is not good enough because I have, okay, so I have a route pointing to the next of device yeah. that is on port, on device A. I have another right route. So this is why VRF works because you're all, to begin with, your device is anchored to a master. That master has to be offloaded into the right device. Right, so you are chaining all, uh, the VRF, the, the net, the, the switch device entity, the hardware switch device entity that, that are, is responsible for to offload that entity. Yes. So why uh, bridge is different than VRF or bond is different than no, VRF? Bridge also, you're doing a device. It's just that I'm, you're not explicitly registering it. You're just marking an FDB or a rule as offload. From the rule, you have to work backwards to see rule points to a next or points to a VRF. Just like FDB points to a port, points to a bridge, points to offload, right? Yeah, but VR, again, why VRF is different than... No, it's not, is what I'm saying. No, but... In, in all cases, you're taking something that is specific. Either an FDP points to a port, right? And therefore, the bridge and the port are offloaded to a particular device. So I guess the question that... Let me give you your harder question. What if I have a bridge with some ports in one device and some ports in a different device? Right. That's the harder one, and I don't know the answer. No, so, so I can choose to fail it. Or, or to support it or not. This is my yeah. choice, right? But I, I have the knowledge to handle that. So that's a good one. Yeah. I, I don't have a strong answer. Anybody else? If start with not splitting, right? Baby steps. Start with offloading only within a device. Don't go across devices. Yeah, I would probably start there. Um, so generally speaking, I would suggest the stateless solution to the fixing the main problem you were discussing earlier. I mean, it's just, it just seems like, because the, the trade-off seems to be finding the, the device drivers that need the uh, notifier hook versus finding all the blobs from all those places that need to be stored in a centralized location and managed and updated. It, that seems more complicated than just having notifiers in the correct places. That's just my opinion. And, and Ido, actually, to, to, uh, to add, you said something very important. The the stateless model is also not user visible. If we want to change a policy later, we, have, we reserve the right. If we introduce the alternate method now, we have to keep carrying that forward. And I don't think the win is sufficiently enough. OK. Uh, OK. So less problem. Uh, and so basically, in the, in, for many devices, we have this NDO called FDB-Ed that 
was introduced by SRIOV, right? Uh, and we use it for switch dev drivers to configure uh, FDB entries from user space uh, using bridge FDB. Uh, and this is only invoked uh, via self flag. So obviously, currently, if we don't have any, any ties to the hardware for a certain lag device, so this obviously fails. Um, and personally, I don't think it's a problem, because uh, wh where do you want to configure this uh, FDB? Um, so in the static approach, this will be programmed in hardware, but we will have to have some link, and this is probably this switch dev zero device. Yeah, this, this is actually related to what uh, Matti mentioned before that. It's <coughs> Similar problem. Yeah, so I, I, I know we don't have this problem, so I'm sure it can be solved. Uh, but I, I, I guess you tied uh, all created devices to the, devi uh, to the device, right? Correct. So you are implicitly so static. Question to you. So what, what are you doing with this role? Are you caching it until the hardware comes up, or you just have a hardware with no ports? You don't need to cache, right? The what, kernel always what is the point of the switch dev zero device? Oh, what is, oh, oh sorry. Right. So, uh, okay. at least in our case, um, since we are aware of this lag, we configure this lag in hardware, and we can also configure this FDB in hardware. So we don't need to cache it in driver and wait for the first port to join. It's, but isn't the concept of port already provisioned in hardware by this point? Otherwise, how is the lag? even working in hardware. Don't you have to aggregate ports to create a lag? No. I mean, we yes. can create an empty lag and simply bind ports to it in hardware. Yeah, what, what is the representation of that empty lag in hardware, in software, I mean? What? What is the representation of this lag in software? So it's basically a lag device without any ports. Yeah, it's, it's a bond zero without any ports in that. Of That's type it. lag? What is the type? Yeah. Bond. Type lag. Bond team. And the bond is set as lag. No, the, the bond is lag. The bond is the bonding. So it's, a, it's a it's a lag with a, no you, ports. You have a bonding device without any slaves, and you add it to the bridge. That's kind of confusing. Oh, it's but not. it's valid. It's a, it's a lag, but it has no ports. What is it aggregating? It, it, so we we can we can actually. This particular uh, scenario, we can we can uh, set up right away in the hardware. It's right, completely right. valid. So yeah, so in the inter so we have 25 minutes to get through this. So I, I, I think this is this particular thing sounds like you guys have a use case. Like I said, we I can assure you we've not run into it. So there must be some communication thing that we have to go solve. And we can take this offline. It's probably worth making a note and saying it's worth going. But I think. For all the other reasons we just said, let's go with plan A. Once we hit the wall with plan A, then we can come back and, no pun intended, try plan B. Um, okay, so that dynamic first, static maybe later. Yes. yes. Um, okay. All right. Oh. Um, next, I was going to the surprise guest is Pablo, since he obviously didn't have anything to do uh, in this whole conference. So you want to give us a quick update on NFT? Switch the stuff. Yes, I'm not going to consume much time. There is only 25 minutes left, and tomorrow I have a presentation, a talk that is going to specifically cover this topic. So, well, what I will be explaining tomorrow is that basically what I have is a patch set. That it's basically composed of three blocks. The first block is addressing the code that needs to be added to the front end, necessary hooks to to communicate to communicate NF tables with with switch dev. There is also code that we've been also talking about in the previous uh, in the TC workshop is um, independent representation that should be possible to be reused by other front ends. Basically it's based on and on the code that we have in, in user space it's capable of representing Payload matching, payload mangling, uh, meta matching, meta mangling, and actions, and then the the first client of that code is going to be the rocker switch. So, so 
So, yeah. So tomorrow I provide a bit more details on the, the, the presentation we have. Uh, we'll show the structures and the API that it uses, basically um, a set of uh, structures and, and function, a helper function that allows you to, to uh, iterate over, to, to build the, the, uh, the syntax abstract, abstract tree and then walk over it to populate the internal representation to get it into hardware. And so tomorrow I will provide a bit more details. So a high level state, uh, actually, any questions, anything that anybody wants to ask about? Any? Jerry yeah. always wants to see the code. Come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're going with the Jamal advertising <laughs> model. Uh, but I think the high level point that uh, we talked a little bit about is that there are too many representations. And while I believe Jamal's statement of we, sh we should be like Unix, allow all models, I think some Yes, I totally agree with that. I'd rather have n models than zero, which is what we have at the Right. <laughs> but n can't be a very large number either. It will be, but I mean, we have to start somewhere. Yeah. yeah. OK. So thank you, uh, Pablo. Um, the next person, I could just stick around here, maybe, Pablo. No, right. He's running away. Um, my next surprise speaker was Rupa. An update from us. So we've been, actually Scott Feldman set this up, we have been having a switched up bi-weekly call. It's kind of invite only right now because of the limit uh, on the conference uh, call. But if anybody wants to join, you always can email me if you have interest in contributing to switched up. Uh, it's a bi-weekly call. If you don't know her email address, it means you're not on NetDev. You should probably it's start subscribing. It's Rupa at Cumulus Networks. No, no, no. You can uh, catch me later as well. So uh, the uh, Shijit brought up stats. I did want to emphasize on stats. Um, stats become very important on a NOS, and we have been. Uh, Not Shijit. Oh, Jamal wanted stats. Jamal. Let's get the sentence right. Okay. <laughs> uh, and we have, yeah, we have stats. We try to provide stats for all virtual devices that we offload. Uh, one thing, I wanted to bring switch port stats. Jiri and I talked about it a little bit yesterday. So we do provide hardware stats on the switch port stats, which becomes very easy for monitoring demons like SNMP and so on. Um, basically, we have ETH tool stats, uh, and also the NetDev stats we pull um, from hardware, and we add it to NetDev stats whenever anybody calls uh, whatever, IP minus S on the NetDev. Um, and apart from that, we have VLAN dev stats. Um, we have some hooks. Uh, we carry patches, but we do want to integrate them at, with, at, with switch dev at some point. So basically, it will require a switch dev API to query the hardware if that particular logical device is backed by, is offloaded, and then add those stats to the net dev stats of, uh, for example, bond or bridge. Um, ACL stats. I know there was some discussion about TC and the rule stats. And again, the same model. Um, we do try to, uh, we have our own API and cache in the kernel because we run a user space driver today, but which pushes stats into the kernel. And then there is an API which uh, is hooked into for ACL rules, which calls into this cache, hardware cache, and returns the user or adds to the software stats. Uh, that will apply to VRF and MPLS and so on. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was port splitter management, which was, uh, again, came up uh, in Jiri's talk, uh, or Jiri discussed a few days back. And what we have done there is, which works very well, is we provide a user space management uh, interface uh, for the user to indicate which ports he wants to split. And then we create the net devs based on that. And today we use, uh, we use a user space driver, so we use a ton tap device. So we create uh, a ton uh, tap device with whatever the user has uh, indicated his request to split. So for a 40 gig port, if you want to split it into 10 gig, we create four ton tap devices. So that's why I was uh, indicating that we should have an abstraction to a switch port abstraction, which which netlink you could configure, tell the switch dev driver to actually um, specify the port and the hardware, whatever the logical port and hardware which it needs to map to. 
So the switch driver can understand that it's uh, being split. Um, other than that? So I, I wanted to make a quick in interjection about stats. So one thing that is very important, right? I mean, we talked about this a little bit with classifiers earlier. Um, when, you're when you're looking at things from a NIC host perspective, you know what traffic you're originating. Being able to have every last detail of every last stat is a little less mm -hmm. important. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not as important as if you're a middle box. You have no idea what just came your way. You have no idea what you just did. If there's any component anywhere that is doing something and not recording it, and you can't go back and look that this did it, you're in a world of hurt, right? This is a very important psychological thing to think about, because if, if you have a classifier entry that dropped a packet and didn't tell anybody about it, you have no idea who you just dropped, and no one can find that packet, ever. VXLAN, um, so again, we have had uh, hallway discussions about VXLAN offloads. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring out there was, um, so we have, uh, we have found some uh, solutions to some problems with uh, keeping FTBs in sync when you have a VXLAN device and a VLAN device both into a bridge. The VXLAN device has its own FTB, and the bridge device has its own FTB. And uh, we have real, uh, there are cases when Mac moves from remote to local, uh, when the VXLAN driver today takes a long time to age the Mac, which kind of create, creates problems. The Mac is both on the VLAN device, in the bridge FTB and the VXLAN FTB pointing to two different ports. So we do have some patches to actually keep those FTBs in sync, that is, to if we see a Mac move, we uh, try to bring the FTBs in sync by introducing an NDO op to, from the bridge to, if the lower device has its own FTB, we try to delete it proactively. So that is something uh, which might. Did, did everybody understand the problem? Was yeah, there, I, uh, I realized that I should <laughs> yeah. show a picture, but I. So this is a structural issue, specifically if you have a bridge with a VXLAN device on it. Picture. Oh, you have a picture, yeah, but we can't. That. Yeah, okay. So. That's okay, but if you happen to do, I guess. But this, in some sense, Rupa, goes back to the co conversation we had about the dynamic model, right? So if you do the dynamic model, this actually gets solved because you would resolve the tree again on the attachment and you would have to take care of it. Yeah. So that's what the whole point is you have to take care of this thing proactively yeah. than. Uh, sorry, Oh, there's one with him. Yeah. yeah, I have small comment to the to the problem you just described. Uh, I think that maybe you can just uh, use uh, FDB at or FDB del notifier from the VXLAN up to the bridge, and that's yeah, I have I have thought about that actually. I was thinking of you already have a. Switch dev FTB learnt uh, yeah, notifier, right. right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we have tried to use. There are some corner cases, but you know, when you get to it, we could. Uh, so what we the quick solution was to actually introduce. Okay, let me say it this way. Um, the solution. There was one problem with Mac move from uh, one direction. I forget from outside uh, from to from inside. outside to inside the bridge. What we did was it was quicker to actually introduce and endure, endure call from, so the, so the bridge driver knows that the Mac move has happened, right? Mm -hmm. It has moved from its VXLAN port to its VLAN port. It knows that it's happened. And so, and it knows that, and you, it can check for an NDO op if the lower device, if the port has its own FTB, it can call a Dell on that FTB. So that's what we did because that was one quick, that was the only problem that was, uh, were hurting us, and that was much easier than keeping this. I have walked through that. I will probably discuss with you offline. The because you have the switch driver already populating via notifier externally learned FTB entries. Then you have this VXLAN device in between, who is also possibly listening to this notifier, and it kind of gets a little. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have another question regarding the, the stats. So uh, you said that you add the hardware counters to the counters to the software counters actually, and you uh, pass it to the user space. So, uh, is there any way to user to know uh, the real software counters? Sorry, what was that? Uh, I mean, if if I'm a user and I I don't care about the hardware counters, I only want to get the software counters. So, can I get it? <laughs> One way is. I mean, if the user wants to subtract it, oh. each tool is always an option where you can that might not give be, hardware yeah, specific that, stuff. That would be, yeah, exactly. And then the user will have to, actually, I think some of some people just do that. They subtract the native stats. Yeah, yeah. So, so it depends entirely on what the device is even, right? If it was, for example, a bridge device with broadcast, it gets very hard to separate the hardware forwarded from the software forwarded. This is not an area of consistent behavior at all. But, but I guess, uh, Dave, I think maybe a question worth thinking about is, do we want to, as part of the infrastructure, keep them separate? I mean, is there a long-term use to... From the argument perspective of information has been lost, yet it's probably the way to do yeah, it. Yeah. We have to do it uh, eventually, because for, 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 for switches, yeah, it, I, it's I, not that much of a problem, I, I guess, but, the, but for uh, embedded switch in NIC, no, Jerry, actually, it is a problem even for a real switch. So, so consider the case where a pack, like you flooded a frame and you sent one packet towards the CPU and you were expecting hardware flooding to happen. But what actually happened was hardware didn't flood, the software forward flooded it. And the end user only sees, instead of 10 gig rate, 100 megabit rate, right, or something. And you need to be able to see, because if all you're seeing is counters, you can't tell whether software forwarded it or hardware forwarded it. And then you have things like with the hardware NIC case, the VLAN device doesn't actually kind of exist at all. It, the hardware is just putting the tags on and off it transparently and there's no way to, you don't see anything in the software VLAN device at all. So I don't know what's better from the user's perspective. This, this can go into your big statistics. Oh, my statistic yep. blob. Another statistics <laughs> problem. Oh, no. <laughs> Where's Jamal? <laughs> He's smiling. Then, okay, then obviously, there is VRF, uh, which David has been working on, VRF offload. Maybe, yeah, we discussed problems with VRF. With well, there's VRF a rule one, right? The, the rules one, yeah, that's the, the biggest one. Yeah. We're going to, what did we conclude? We're going to try and relax the rules. We're going to try to relax the test specifically for these cases. And yeah, and then we think that transparently it should work. The only question was where do we put the, the generic test somewhere in, in the existing code or do we put it in the drivers? I don't want to see it in the drivers. I think it's kind of a fundamental thing. Because it will be removed in one place, otherwise you will have drivers with inconsistent removal. Yeah, it, it, the bugs will propagate and think yeah. bugs won't, and bug fixes will not. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. And, and yeah, MPLS and VRF, I guess, is yeah, next year's ball. Next year's ball. This is the yeah. teaser. We are working on MPLS, but next year's ball will do There was one last speaker that I had. Uh, where is John Fasterbend? There he is. But he mostly did all of his speaking last, in the last BOF. However, we're going to drag him up here and give us a TC switch dev accelerator quick status update. And while he's setting up, I want people to think about because he's the last speaker. So if you have other things you want to talk about, this is the time when you build your agenda. That's on. Uh, I, I guess I'll just give an update of what we decided, I think, or at least how I interpreted what we decided. Um, so at the moment, we have an offload hook for U32 and an offload hook for Flower um, classifiers. Uh, I'll submit the patches on Monday. Uh, and then we're going to look at NF table um, kind of after that as either another offload or see if we can unify it somehow. Uh, and uh, that should be out next week. And you're going to add capabilities behind that. Uh, the, once you have the classifier, there's always a question of will this be offloaded or not offloaded. Um, it gets even more interesting when you have really flexible hardware that has programmable parsers. So there's, there's probably a, 
a, another series of patches behind that to look at getting the header gra parser graph and setting the parser graph of the Nix. Um, and not to beat a dead horse, but then there's the issue of uh, our statistics provider not by the hardware and how should we behave, blah, blah, blah. Yep. I mean, I can imagine cases where a user might say, yeah, this Nick may offload TCU32, but for my purposes here, I really need those numbers. Therefore, I would prefer to do it if you did it in software and didn't offload it to the card and gave me the stats instead. Yeah, my sort of opinion on this is we should let, um, because our hardware doesn't always, not just our hardware, hardware in general, usually has a, a fewer banks for statistics than it can actually support in the, whatever the mechanism it's, you know, TCAM, SRAM, MPU, whatever, um, that we should allow users to put rules in the hardware if they want to, but we should, we should definitely make that a flag or something so that yeah, users aren't getting this unexpected behavior where, hey, I learned this rule and now I don't have statistics, right? Like I think so, okay, so the, the next part of that discussion where this goes next is uh, how do you look at this from the perspective of pr preserving existing software behavior? Right. That's exactly the problem. Okay, so none of the solutions are really nice yes. because we would, we would like to transparently make things go into hardware if possible from a performance perspective. At the same time, if the device doesn't provide statistics, that's not providing a consistent a user observable behavior from before and after. So, okay. so there's a balancing act we have to uh, think so about. Sure. So my, my statement would be, I think the default should be offload requires stats and you have to do some override to say explicitly I'm taking, taking the risk, I'm going Rambo on this, give me the no stats version. The thing is the, the buy-in doesn't take care of the fact that most users don't care. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they don't know that they don't care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when right? they, that's that's yeah. the issue. And when they care, they'll be pissed either way. Yes. But even if they're bought in. So we, we can't win. Yeah. Right? Um, so I think a little, you know. So the beauty of this is that it's it's a it's a pervasive issue. So once we pick a policy, we have to stick to it everywhere. So. <laughs> so my policy, therefore, my policy suggestion is default stats. Go Rambo if you want to. That's the policy. Right? Okay. So you're, do you suggest that there's a Rambo Netlink attribute? Yes, Netlink. The Rambo mode. RT, Rambo. RT, RT and Rambo. <laughs> okay, we'll have to sort out the details, but I think that's a good summary of the situation. All right. Jamal's joining the... Oh, no. Why did you talk about stats and expect me to be quiet? <laughs> he was happily typing away and then somebody said stats. Je Je is Jesse here? Jesse. Yeah. Back there. So what do you think of this idea of stats always being present? Because you may have limitations in your hardware, right? I mean, the default behavior right now that users expect, when I say drop, I get stats with that. How many exactly, bytes are dropped? Exactly. How many yeah, bytes? But here's the bytes? thing: we violate this premise already. The VLAN thing is an awesome example. Yeah. You don't get any freaking stats. Yeah, if yeah, but the card, if the card is offloading VLAN encapsulation on transmit, you get zilch. Right, but for the drops and accepts, we always get stats today. I understand. You get ETH tool stats, which are per device, random strings in a. Something that dumps <laughs> from the driver. I mean, yeah, you have to go unique. find Yoda to tell you what, what the hell you just read. So, I mean, as one possibility, you could do, instead of for drop rules, you could actually just put the, um, you could actually put the rule being a count or, or a track rule or mark it and then just drop it in the driver and actually increment a stat in software, right? So you could actually pass that, that drop. The driver can drop packets really fast, I mean like obscenely fast. You do have to DMA it and you can't just drop it in the hardware, which is a little less valuable, right? But um, An explicit count action is how almost every SDK I've seen actually does it. I mean, it seems to work okay. Right, so I mean, that, that's one possible implementation. Which would basically be that it. flag, the Rambo, the Rambo bit. Get the <laughs> Rambo bit and you get an explicit count. Right. So that's one way you could solve it. I mean, we just brought that up when we were just discussing it sitting back there in the chair. So I, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but it's one way to solve the problem that's available. So, um, you know, I'd actually prefer the hardware to drop in most cases. What, what rates do you get from that? I, I think a count action doesn't... Seen, seen like with very little CPU, yeah. So, Jamal, you want to you know what the packets per second of dropping packets is? It's in line rate. On the driver, I mean, 
It's line rate. You're not. You mean in the hardware or in the driver? Thirty million packets per second. In, in the hardware or in the driver? In in the well, in this case because we have no counts. I guess counters are a limited resource in this hardware. In the hardware? Yes. So you're so, going to so emulate we, this. In general, you it, it's the speed of the actual device. Adding rules doesn't slow down the speed. No, no. If I'm going to be pushing packets out, so just so I can get counters. That's what I understand. The counters are the same speed. So longer to increment the counter in memory than it will to drop the Let, Let's have a flag so, that so this, this, this driver is not fully capable of doing stats in hardware. Then we'll at least so I, I think I think I think uh, if I understand Jesse's idea correctly, well. we have the packet in the receive descriptor, we execute the TC action on that raw data, and then we just to recycle drive. the descriptor if there was a drop. So it's, this is just an optimization on... I don't know if it's an optimization, it's an optimization. I, I, I think this is really interesting because it means that we can provide TC dropping on receive even for devices that don't have the offload exactly. capability and cool. get some performance benefit from that. I, I do believe the performance is not going to be as good as having the count and handle. Am I correct in that assumption? I would agree. Okay. Of course. I mean, yeah, so we need, we need a flag just so the user knows that this is what the hardware is We've agreed on Rambo okay. mode already. Is that the Rambo bit? Yeah. Okay, I'm set. Rambo is the answer. <laughs> All right, anybody else wanting to step up? Oh, I see somebody yeah. stepping up. Yeah. Woo <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm still very interested in using SwitchDev for the small scale routers. Yeah. And one of the things that is, yeah. I'll just... You self-selected yourself to speak yeah. about that. Um, one, of, one of the things that is, is coming up more frequently is we're getting more devices that have multiple CPU ports connected to one switch. And I don't know how to handle that from an API perspective or how to, how to even integrate that. Doesn't DSA have an abstraction for this? Uh, not as far as I know. I, okay. At least I haven't seen anything. Maybe I missed something. Someone's raising their hand. There was a second microphone? Yeah. Where, where's our second microphone? We have oh. it over here. So DSA currently doesn't have that, but I played around with it and set it a bond on top of the CPU ports, mm -hmm. which partially works. You're getting problems with MAC addresses. It could be taken further and you could do it. But then you get the question of how do you load balance between the two CPU ports to the other ports? So that was actually my question before we solved the problem. Why do you need, I mean, obviously one answer is keep one port unconnected, right? Uh, so the typical use case is this. You have a router that has a few LAN ports and a WAN port. And ah, okay. they're all connected to the same switch and you want the LAN ports to come up on one device and one on another. Uh, so you can load balance more easily. So you don't actually get to do this per per flow, or maybe maybe you do, but the but standard capability is to to just have it. Uh, but you can't even grouped. do the bond then, right? Because you are trying to keep the two ports separate. Yes, no, it, it's separate. Well, I'm trying to keep it separate. <laughs> yeah, you can't bond but them. with DSA, the ports are separate to start with, and then you bridge them together. So as long as you don't create a bridge, they're separate. Yeah, but I want to create between uh, a, a bridge with some ports coming to one CPU port and another port coming to another CPU port. But as far as I know, the CPU ports aren't really represented that way. No, they're not there. The CPU ports don't exist in terms of you cannot see them as net devs or anything. Exactly. And but that's potentially a problem with DSA. That's why I set up a blind bond device and I just use them as two and I try to do load balance over them as best as possible. Okay. And then you can fill it with it using your, DS, uh, your device table, device trace setup. Okay, so just create an empty bond just with, an, ah, okay. I'll try that. <laughs> one, wouldn't one option for you be just call them two switch dev instances, one on this side, one on that side? But then you've got to split your available switch ports between the two different DSAs. But I thought they are split, aren't they? No, no they aren't split. They're, dyna they're dynamically assignable. Mm. I just want the, the, the so groups is there, split. Is there any out here? Like, it looks like all the <laughs> outs are taken away. Uh, OK, it's an interesting limitation of the available interfaces we have right now, for sure. I've never heard of that use case before, but at least now we're aware of it.
I have quite a few devices at home that have this, this set, sort of this setup. configuration. Okay, so we have to yep. think seriously about it then. And do you even have to forward between these ports ever? Like, is there any scenario where you're forwarding between the CPU ports? Well, I do routing, but that in software, but I hope to offload that in hardware as well. Yeah, so then you point. wouldn't be going this way, right? You would be forwarding in hardware and you would never come up and go back. Yeah, but I cannot forward everything, so there, there's always going to be some kind of software involvement there. So some of the some of the some of the traffic would still go up the CPU port, whereas yeah. the rest you want to directly switch between yeah. ports. So right, and actually traffic has to go to the CPU port first, so it can it learn trigger the, the offload and learn yes. everything. Okay. Plus, quite a lot of it's going to your wireless LAN. Yeah, <laughs> that's also something that's different with DSA. Sure. Typically, a lot of it's going towards the host to go to the wireless LAN, not in one port and back out another port. Right. Yeah, okay, so that's what I'm asking. So it's okay to come to the CPU and get forwarded back out, which would also work for the one port case, right? I'm explicitly asking the question, do you have scenarios, and I think I just heard a yes, where the packet comes in on one, hairpins, and goes out the other? Because now these are no longer equivalent ports. You have to treat them differentially as well. So you have to treat them equally for some and differentially for some cases. Yeah, I, th I think in the case of when, when they come in and they go out and it's all offloaded, then uh, that's fine. I can just create a hardware rule to take care of that. And that's fine, exactly. That, because, that's fine. It's because logically that would have been the same even if you had only one port. It would come up, get learned, and get forwarded back out. Exactly. Right? Then the, two, the fact that there are two instances is just numbers. But if you ever end up saying, I have to differentially decide, packet came in here, it couldn't go back out this way, it has to go out the other one, then you have yet another complexity that you'll have to deal with. Is that complexity there? Do you have that complexity? Um, I don't think it has to be in internally. It's just, it, if it comes in and it gets routed, and it gets routed by the software stack, it, it should be fine. If it gets bridged by the software stack, it should also be fine because it, it arrives out on the, it comes out on the bridge interface and then the network stack deals with it and then it may go out to different bridge interface or something. Yeah. Um, or a port interface. You also got to remember the D in DSA. You can have multiple switch chips in a chain. And at the moment, there's no, we're missing the logic in the switch drivers to go from switch to switch without necessarily going up and back down again. Yeah, because this creates a high, com I mean, now you have hierarchical switching. Yeah, that's the whole bit about DSA is like you can arbitrarily stack things in different manners and yeah, yeah. by design. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy that I didn't need this so far. <laughs> I haven't seen any advice. I'm working with a board that's got four switches on it, oh. and it's not nice. <laughs> All right, so next year or next time we do this, you guys are going first, because you're going to tell us what cool solution you have to this problem. Yeah, we look forward to your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no idea of a... Uh... I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. I want to hear more. Uh, this sounds like a very... Yeah, it wasn't definitely on any of our radars. I'm looking around the room. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts? It's probably something no one's going to solve. Oh, Jiri has a thought. Surprise. Yeah, I think that for DSA, it might be possible to just uh, represent uh, every port, including the, the CPU ports as net device. And then you can, by adding it to uh, the ports to bridges, you can do the separation, right? And you can also do bonding on top of that and everything. It kind of aligns. Um, it's something we've been backwards and forwards a few times. Do we actually represent the CPU port, yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> In this case, you might. So then you would have uh, two bridges for, for each CPU port. You, and the, the group of ports it belongs to, do you have two bridges? And then if you want to bridge it, you have another bridge to bridge it. Why not? But th those two would be just to configure the hardware. Why not? I think that this might be the solution for you. Wouldn't make it easy. Yep. Uh, so, unfortunately, we're running out of. John, you were saying something. Did you have a comment you wanted to? I, I just said it sounds like a unique problem. You might try submitting code that fixes it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on that note, I think we're out of time, so we're going to call this a day. Thank you for coming. Uh, See you again next time. <laughs>